when one visits the Biennale, one of the feelings is that we ne you need, the curator need to, f to feel the spaces, the gigantic spaces. What do you think about that? I think rather than fill them, you need to feel them. And uh, I believe very strongly that architecture changes the character of the art that is shown within it. So that one of the most important things is thinking about the relationship between which works of art go in which building, because the Biennale in Venice has two venues with completely different architectural characters. One is a very heavy industrial building, uh, it was a rope making factory, the Arsenale, and the other is the central pavilion, which is a neoclassical gallery space. So I think it's important how you feel these spaces, how the works that are shown in each one takes advantage of that kind of space to help enhance and amplify what it, how it talks to you. So the idea of very large space is not a big point? Very large space, um, you know, inevitably you end up filling these spaces and it's a very funny process sometimes how that happens. At one point, I think every other artist was asking me for 400 square meters, ah. which nobody gets to have. But I also, in this Biennale, I'm, I have half the number of artists that were in the 2015 Biennale. But because each artist is getting two chances to show two different types of work, I'm ending up in the same place. So whereas I thought I might have a very generous spatial display, it will be as crowded as it always is. And um, one thing that we're doing that's different though, is I'm working with an architect in London, Nikolai Devendal, to create a very different presentation in the Arsenale. So instead of these long corridors that it's normally you find there, and this is a 300 meter long rectangle, uh, we're gonna divide it much more into horizontal bays. It'll be much more labyrinthine, and the walls though will be made of fabric, most of them, rather than the white walls of an art fair. Ah, okay. So it should have a very different feeling that I hope allows people to focus better on the works they encounter and not to see this endless corridor of 20 artists' work stretching out in front of you. What were the Biennale, the former Biennale that you take as references that really interested you? Um, for this Biennale, I mean, there have been, you know, several Biennales that I've enjoyed quite a lot, but perhaps for this one, it's really the Biennale that Francesco Bonomi curated with nine other curators. And I think it was the idea there that the Biennale could be divided into many different sections. Mm -hmm. That exhibition was almost divided geographically with curators from different regions looking at artists from those regions. And there wasn't necessarily a strong connection between the different sections. Whereas what I'm doing is quite different, but there was something interesting in that approach that I, I liked. You have imagined a double exhibition, two sides of the same exhibition, which is a very interesting concept, but why after all two, only two? What does two mean? Two sides always? Well, I think for an exhibition this size, if you had three different versions, it would be too much to take in. I think two is allows the easiest, most direct kind of comparison. And of course, it's also based on the idea that there are these two venues with very different characters. So that helps create the feeling of two distinct exhibitions. Um, and to some extent, the works are chosen for each space because they go well with that kind of space or they comment on that kind of space in, in, in one respect or another. You know, I think um, in a way, ideally this was a, you could have an almost infinite series of parallel exhibitions. Yes. Um, but for practical reasons, I think this is, it's enough to suggest the possibility of that.
by having two. But but uh, each artist will have two versions? Yes, each artist appears in both of the propositions, Proposition A and Proposition B, but they are showing different kinds of work. Now, in some cases, uh, you will still recognize that that's this artist. They're, they still are making paintings, but the subject might be quite different. Uh, the content might be quite different. But sometimes an artist is doing a completely different style of work, and you would really have no idea that this was the same person. They might be making a, a print in one building and a film installation in the other. You say your ideal visitor is not reading the information, the introduction. Why? No, no, not my ideal visitor. <laughs> I, I definitely hope vis visitors do read the texts on the walls. But that in my fantasy, there's a visitor who doesn't read those introductions and imagines that these two exhibitions are actually by a completely different artist because they seem so different. But that can happen, really, it, right? It could happen, yeah. And um, how do you deal with political correctness? By avoiding it as much as possible. I think, you know, the interesting thing to me about the artists in this show is the way they're able to deal with, to create works that can generate many associations that lead to a kind of expansive type of thinking. And in political correctness, there's a, usually only one type of thinking that's allowed, one interpretation, and that's that's the opposite of what I think these artists are about. That's a big point, right? Yes. How do you deal with the art market? The art market's really of no concern to me. Um, the only impact it has is it affects the insurance values of works in the exhibition, which affects our insurance budget. But um, I think an exhibition like this, which is for a broad general public, mm -hmm. and I mean the last Biennale got over 640,000 visitors. These are not people who are participating in the art market. And I know there are some artists who feel that uh, it's very important to comment on the market and art's status as a commodity in that market. But I think art also plays another role where it's can be engaging people outside of that market and speaking to them in a way that's very, can create some very valuable conversations. You curated the Lyon Biennale. Yes. What, what's the difference? Um, the difference is they have some things in common. They both have two principal venues. Uh, the difference in Venice is that it's much bigger and um, you also have this context of the national pavilions, which is unique to Venice. But you don't deal with the national pavilions. I don't, but the exhibition I'm organizing sits alongside them. And to me, there's an interesting dialogue between this utopian idea of an international exhibition that's a global, somehow, <laughs> cultural exchange between countries from all over the world, and the nationalist pavilions, which represent a very old manifestation of national identity. Olympic Games. Exactly. What is your next dream? Uh, well, my next dream is going to be seeing the Biennale open with everything working <laughs> <laughs> as planned, because right now that still seems like a dream. What would you like people to remember about you? Um, you know, I'm not very concerned about what people remember about me. I, I hope they come to this exhibition and remember, you know, f works of art that really moved them and made them think differently. Because my, you know, for me, what's most important with an exhibition is not just the experience you have inside the gallery, but what happens afterwards. Are you able to see the world a little differently, to make connections between things you didn't connect before because of this experience you had. And if people have that kind of experience, that's more important to me than if they remember the names of the artists or even the artworks. Uh, merci.